So as Michael said, my name is Tom Frederick. Uh, I'm a graduate student at UNL and partner in Nirvana. I have a background in mechanical engineering and uh, through my work with Dr. Frederick, the commercialization through the biomedical uh, device set. My name is Anna Boyum and I'm a scientist. I've been doing pharmaceutical research here at UNMC for several years now. And like Michael mentioned, I met Dr. Frederick, who has become our advisor and worked closely with us to share his entrepreneurial expertise and teach us a few things about how to build a company. Um, today we will tell you about our first instrument, which we designed and developed for frozen tissue sectioning. And a couple of words of frozen tissue sectioning. Um, frozen sectioning is a diagnostic procedure, and one of the examples of when frozen sectioning will be used is, for example, during cancer surgery. And what happens during cancer surgery is a surgeon takes a small piece of tissue from um, a patient and freezes it and sections it very thinly, prepares those very thin sections, like this one, for example, and puts them on the microscope slide. Then it's observed under the microscope to see if there's any cancer cells le there left. A cancer tumor can regrow from one cell, so it's very important. The outcome of a cancer surgery will depend on the quality of frozen tissue sectioning. It's a very dynamic procedure and it's performed at a very fast pace, and there is really no time to waste. Now, the wasting time comes from using non-specialized tools that are not developed for frozen sectioning, and that they are, for example, a paintbrush from an art store, some random forceps, a razor blade, some sharpies, and even a butter knife from your grandma's pantry. So that presents a problem, and um, quite a few people actually experience this problem. There is 300,000 people who do frozen tissue sectioning, and some of them are more experienced, like this guy here, for example, and this is a picture of myself. I've been doing frozen sectioning um, quite a bit over the course of my PhD work, and this is when I thought of the problem, and I was an experienced user. Now, these guys are students and trainees, and some of them, who probably will never have to do frozen sectioning, are happy and they're smiling, they got their stethoscopes. But this guy is probably a pathology resident, and maybe he doesn't have a lot of experience, and he's just trying to figure out frozen sectioning. So, for people like them, we have developed an instrument that we're talking about today. Uh, now, this instrument that we've developed, it has several uh, you know, key points to it. And one is many technicians share the same freezer, the same cryostat. And they all have different, really specific, you know, what they're looking in for a tool. And that might be a, you know, what the brush type is or just you know, what kind of brush they want to use. So what we've developed is this VersaTool, and this has two interchangeable tips, and as well as an embedded knife. So as Anna mentioned, instead of a butter knife out of the pantry, you know, we'll just put it on the tool for you. Um, there are many you know, downsides to having all of those brushes in there, having to dig through, changing the tools during one procedure. So the interchangeable tip allows you to go quickly from a small tip used for manipulating the sample to a larger tip that might be used to clean the, clean the stage. Now, with that, you know, the initially we're looking to just offer a couple different options, but as you can imagine, every technician has their own specific brush, so we can expand that to different brush styles. But there are also other needs for teasing needles, forceps, or even just a pencil, you know, something to write on the slide, something to contain the stain. Now, looking at what the first tool has versus what the other options are, you can go buy a paintbrush, you can go buy a Sharpie, but getting all of those, you know, we try to improve upon all of those downsides. A paintbrush was not meant to be in a crowd stat. It's, it's got metal near the tip. There's a lot of drawbacks, and we aim to fix that with this VersaTool. So we've been able to produce working prototypes, and we've gotten them out to the labs, out to the technicians that actually use them, and they've gotten back to us, and you know, they want to keep them. We, we can't get them back from them, uh, which is great feedback. You know, they're using them daily and they've got positive experiences with these tools. <coughs> with that, you know, the advantages that we do have is, Anna, as she mentioned, has done this. She's experienced the pain of staying there Saturday night needing to get a sample and it just not working. But through our experience with Dr. Ferger and the, uh, the help that we've gotten from Unimed in taking this and moving this forward, we feel like, you know, sitting here with a provisional patent filed on it, and um, being able to take this tool specifically designed for pathology 
gives us a, a distinct advantage in approaching these uh, technicians in these labs. We plan to initially offer the Versatil to locally to people through our extended network and possibly regionally, and we have started to do that, so we already had some initial sale, sales. Um, we also plan to continue on to travel to industry events such as trade shows and offer Versatil there. And very importantly, we have launched our website today that has an online store functionality, so that's an important step forward to um, being able to offer Versatil to a broader group of users. But most importantly, to reach the biggest number of potential users, we'll have to partner with a big biomedical supply and instrument distributors that um, have access to all those users already and will be able to offer our product through their um, channels. So for example, right now we offer a kit that has a handle and three standard tips. It's cost $150, but we also offer all of those individual components, so your replacement tips, for example, for the ones that wear off and get ruined eventually so uh, users can refill their supply. And this is just an example of an average medical center that, let's say, has le eight cryostats, and um, this med center probably has a lot more than that. So from just offering our product to just this one medical center or one hospital, the annual revenue would, we generate would be over $2,000. So that's just an example. We also, like I mentioned, um, plan to offer Versatile to uh, large distributors um, by a lesser price, 75% retail price. And I'm glad to say that we have already started talking to some of them about potential partnerships in the future. It's very hard to accurately predict what the sales would be within the first three years. But the important point here is that we will break even on the molds, which is going to be our biggest investment during the first year, after only 71 kits sold. And that's a very achievable number. Within a year, we went from an idea to a fully functional prototype that our users really liked to a product that we sold. So our future big step would be scaling up manufacturing procedures and also attracting somebody with business expertise to continue um, help us run company. We're currently looking for an investment of $40,000, which will help us transition to large-scale manufacturing. We will be able to produce our product on a large scale and bring it to market within just a couple of months after the investment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, of the 300,000 uh, users that are doing these types of procedures, how many of these tools do they need and how quickly do you think you would actually end up saturating the market? That really depends on the kind of user. Trainees would go through tips and will need a lot more replacement tips a lot faster because they tend to ruin them as they use them. More experienced users would probably not need them as often, so every user would need initially a kit to get started and then a trainee will use a couple tips or more a year and an experienced user maybe just use one tip a year. So that really, um, that can really vary depending on the experience level. As the market gets saturated, and she kind of pointed out, it's more of uh, kind of a razor you know, razor for razor blade type of, they have the handle, they need to get a tip. And they're, you know, they already have half the system already. So, you know, as, as it goes on, it goes, decreases in kit sales and goes up in tip sales. Yes? I see that you had a provisional file that was patentable. So there's been analysis that there's not issues with the prior art or obviousness, that this will be eventually issued as a patent. Um, so, yeah, in, in our discussion, it was how, the kind of the difficulty there was how detailed can you get? You know, it does. There was some question of really broadly. It looks like a screwdriver um, on the extreme side of you know an obvious case. But in terms of the specific application, you know, this type of device, um, we feel like there's enough non-obviousness there. Yes, Dr. Bonasar. Uh, so your question is, do we get better sections? It's Right, so several advantages that this instrument has is that first, certain specialty tips are not brushes, and those actually do 
allow to preserve sections better. So they actually have a great advantage. We do have brush tips for users who really you know, prefer to use this kind of tip, which is fine too. We use very high quality materials to manufacture our tips, all of them. And so it's better than just an average brush available currently from an average biomedical supply distributor. The quality is much higher. It also helps save time because all of the functionalities are integrated in one instrument. So instead of putting one down or digging through a tray of brushes, looking for one you need, you have it in your hand. So you can do what you need, flip your tool, do another task, use a knife on the handle. It's, it's one thing, it's in your hand. You don't need to set it down, pick it up. So that saves a lot of time too. Any more questions? Any more questions in the back? It actually uh, generates a lot less static and we knew about that problem and we also worked to address that by reducing the amount of metal parts that are present. So the ferrule that is present in each brush that is currently used is just not there and that helps. So with it, and I've got, we've got some prototypes with this, um, one of the big problems with the standard art brush is the metal ferrule that holds the wooden handle to the brush itself, and this conducts both static electricity from the user's gloved hand, as well as the heat from their hand, warming up the bristle. So we've taken that and isolated the user's hand out of it, so we're able to you know, keep the static electricity to a minimum, and we are working on other ways to actively control the static uh, in a cryostat to uh, address that problem in particular. So that could be our future product. Thank you very much.